like that throughout the sermon. Uh, it was starting to get a little bit better. And then uh, I also, uh, well, I did, uh, I don't know if you knew that the state high school games were uh, on, online for 3A this year, and I might have taken advantage of that for uh, a few of the early rounds, but uh, yesterday evening went to the games. And uh, as you know, while I live here in, in Heston and I'm a swather, I grew up and graduated uh, from Hillsborough High School. And in Hillsboro, um, we were just blessed growing up there. You, you know, you're, you're able to see the things that other people can't see as a fan, just as being a, growing up in Hillsboro. So it's really our obligation growing up there to help the referees throughout the game. And <laughs> thank you, thank you. And so even though I'm a swather now, that, that special gift that uh, I've been given, I just feel the Lord continuing to, except for the fact that um, I've found people that sit in front of me don't appreciate that gift as much as I do. Um, so, <laughs> thanks, buddy. Um, however, I sat behind uh, JL and Coach Ryder, and uh, they, helped, they helped keep me in line for one thing. There were some Scott City fans that were there, and uh, I... I always try to be, not try to be good, yeah, I try to be good, and uh, had a great time. So there were uh, Abby uh, Decker and is one of the players, Carla Proctor is one of the coaches, um, who else, I, once I start naming names, oh, Olivia um, Brubaker, and um, I, I'm just stopping there and I forgot you and I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> It was just, it's a great time, and uh, it's always a lot of fun to cheer on as a community, some of those things that are going on. This morning, we are in uh, John chapter 14, verses 22 to 31. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn there. Uh, there is a, uh, there should be a Bible in your row, as always. Uh, I encourage you to follow along, make sure what I'm reading to you, the things that we're talking about, are from the scriptures. That's where we continue to want to go to say what is it that God calls us to be and do and, and, and who is it that he truly is. We're on page uh, 875 if you're using the Bible that's there in your row. Will you bow with me and, and pray as, as we go to God's word? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for this week, for the, the opportunity we've had to uh, be with our families, to be at work, at school, places that you take us, uh, how you go with us as we leave from here. Lord, you don't send us out alone, and that's part of what we're, we're going to be looking at this morning, Lord, is, is, is your graciousness to us, how you equip us and empower us to do your work. And uh, I thank you so much, not only for your for your son, whom you, who you gave to save us, but also for the Holy Spirit who you've given to us to guide us and, and to comfort us and to be there with us as well. And so, Lord, uh, as we look into your word again, um, we come to you um, and, and we need to surrender again today uh, to you and to your work within our lives. Uh, we so, so much, so many times want to do what we want to do when we want to do it, and yet you ask us to trust you. And uh, Lord, I, I pray that we would continue to learn what obedience that comes out of love truly looks like. And, and I thank you for your patience with us in that. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter, John chapter 14, verses 22 to 31. We're going to begin in chapter, or excuse me, in verse 22. John 14, verse 22, actually I'm going to start it in uh, 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Iscariot, not Judas Iscariot said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? We get a question. We get another question from one of the disciples. Peter, in chapter 13, verses 36 and 37, says, Where and why are you doing what you're doing, Lord? Thomas, 
in chapter 14, verse 5, says, where and how will this happen? Philip, in verse 8, says, he has some good advice for Jesus in case he's not sure what to do next. He says, why don't you do this now? And now we have Judas, not Judas Iscariot, for he has left the upper room. We have Judas, the disciple who you know of. He's the one who who writes the book of Jude. We have Judas asking a question. Again, wondering, why is Jesus saying the things that he's saying? Why is he calling us to do the things that he's calling us to do? Do you ever have questions Do you ever read scripture and wonder, why is it that God says the things that he does? Do you ever doubt what he's called you to do? Do you ever sit there and think, because I have these doubts and these questions that I can't answer, that I can't figure out, that it's wrong to ask them, perhaps to admit that you have questions and doubt? Do you ever feel that way? I feel like that a lot especially now that I'm a pastor, right? That, well, you're supposed to know. You're supposed to have, have it figured out. Otherwise, how would it be that you'd be standing up here, right? You, you should have the questions figured out. No, we continue to go back to, we continue to go back to his word. Do we ask those questions? No, because a lot of times it causes conflict, doesn't it? For example, Creation. I believe in a six-day creation, but others here might not believe that. Then what? Am I allowed to bring that up? Am I allowed to ask somebody about that, talk to somebody else about it? How about homosexuality? What if we think differently about that? What if we argue with that? What if we wrestle with that? I believe God's given us not only his word, but also his spirit, as we'll see this morning, And we're called to have conversations about that. I continue to learn and to grow as I talk to others who don't believe the same as me. Now, do I have good reasons why I believe what I believe? Without a doubt. And of course, when you come around to my thinking, we'll believe exactly the same, right? But that's what we're all thinking. That's what we're all thinking is I I got it figured out. And as I continue to go back to God's word, I want to know truth. That's my greatest desire is to know truth. But as believers, when we come together, there's a reason why there's 10 churches in this town and not one. True? We have different beliefs, different heritages, perhaps, that we come from. But we all come back here and say, yeah, but I believe God's word. And yet, even within this congregation, I bring up the subject of creation homosexuality, I could go down the list, right? Because you have them and I have them of those topics where I say, well, I, I, I can't really talk about that. What if we have questions? Is your God big enough? Is your God big enough to deal with those questions? This is my question to you this morning. Is your God big enough to deal with those questions when we don't agree, when you have doubts? Because what I've seen in the last 30 verses that we've looked at as there have been 11 disciples here together, four of them asking questions directly to our heavenly, well, to their Savior. They've spent three years listening, talking, seeing incredible miracles, and they don't get it, do they? They ask questions, they have doubts. We're going to see this morning... Some of them didn't believe. We're going to see that. They didn't, they didn't totally believe everything that was going on there. And yet they were, Jesus says they will believe when they see it. They want, he's preparing them. So as we think about what it is that we truly believe, and yes, there are some foundational matters when it comes to what it means to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that I'm willing to die for. I... I just put it this way, that I hope I'd be willing to die for, because I haven't been put in that position yet. I hope I would be willing to die for those things, right? We, interesting enough, a few months ago, we talked about some of those things, and that same day, a report came out of people being 
beheaded and then burned alive for what they believe, right? Then they were, because they were Christians. I've never been in that position. I hope when it comes to who Jesus is and what he's done for you and me, that that's something I could stand for, that I could, and be willing to die for. But some of these other topics that we have, we have doubts, we have questions. The way I continue to learn and understand what God's word means is not only through what it says directly to me, not only what the Holy Spirit says to me, but also the believers, the people around me that I talk with, that I disagree with, and that I can learn from, that I can learn from. We're in a family. We've talked about that before. We're in a family. The disciples, as they're here listening to Jesus talk, telling him that he's leaving, that he's going somewhere else, they're talking about this physical, earthly kingdom that they expected the Messiah to set up. And yet Jesus continues to talk about what? Not about the earthly kingdom, but, a, but about a heavenly kingdom that he's establishing. And so Philip asks Jesus, why is it that just us, the disciples, why is it that we only get to see you? Why, why don't you let everyone see who you are? The disciples were making God's kingdom look like the kingdom that they wanted it to look like. A couple thousand years later, we still do the same thing from time to time. Taking his kingdom and saying, I think this is the way the kingdom should look like. We do. We need to continue to go back to his word and say, what does he want? What is he calling us to? And Jesus says, referring back to verse 21, that he's going to reveal himself to the believers. Charles Spurgeon says that there are two seasons in life when it's easiest to see Jesus. See if you agree with him in this this statement. He says there are two seasons of our life when it's easiest to see Jesus. One, when we're serving, times of duty, on a missions trip, perhaps on a committee, leading a Bible study. When you step out and use your gifts to do things you're not sure if you can do, it's amazing how you would, might look back and say, wow, God revealed himself to me like in ways I never imagined he could do. He, there's no way I could do that. But as God led me, it was amazing to see him do. So the season of serving, he also says the season of suffering, times of trial, physical, spiritual, financial need. When we get to the end of ourselves so many times in that season of suffering, again, as we look back, we might say, it was amazing. It was amazing how God provided about finances that we had, the physical healing that I needed, the emotional needs that I had, a a phone call that I got, an email that was sent to me during our times when we're looking for specifically God to speak to us. He goes on to say, we get enough religion to save us but so many times we don't have the relationship enough to help us realize the spiritual blessings and the, and the special blessings that come with knowing him. He calls us to so much more than just, I'm saved. How do we experience that day-to-day blessing of a relationship with him? Verses 23 and following go on to reassure the patience, amazing patience. He's repeated himself now here probably about the third time on some of these subjects, going back over and over again and saying, this is what I'm going to do. Verse 23, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. I read that same thing there in verse 21. You love me? Obedience is rooted in love. And we dissected that last week, right? Love is not called to be rooted in obedience. Obedience is rooted in love. Matthew Henry says, love is the root, obedience is the fruit. We've already studied uh, chapter 15, which is to follow as, as we think about the vineyard. God calls us to remain, abide, to stay connected. Love is the root. Verse 24, anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear from me are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. The people that he doesn't reveal himself to, that is, the world that does not accept him, he says, don't be surprised when they don't obey the things that I'm calling them to do. 
Do you ever expect unbelievers to act like believers? I do. Sometimes I do. I, I sit there and why are they doing that? And yet as I think about where the world is at, or perhaps where my friend, well, of course that makes perfect sense. If you're not going back to God's word or, or what he's calling us to do, yes, we should not expect people that do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ to obey him. They won't. He said more than one time, again, going into chapter 15, that in fact, he uses the word hate. The world will hate you if you follow after me. 25, and then out of verse 25 truly comes the other verses that follow. We're going to look at verse 25, 28, and 29 together, and then we'll pick up 26 and 27 in a minute. Verse 25 says, again, Jesus speaking, all this I have spoken while I am still with you. There's the idea that he is leaving. He says, I, I've said these things to you because I'm about to go away. Now, verse 28, you heard me say I am going away and I am coming back to you. Again, referring to John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. He said he was going to go away and prepare a place and come back for them. Back to verse 28. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. Verse 28. The disciples were disappointed that Jesus was leaving them. How are we going to know what to do? What is that going to look like? Why can't we go with you? Jesus tells the disciples, be glad. I'm about to save the world, not just you 11. I'm about to go to the cross. I have greater things to do. If you knew where I was going, you would rejoice. It's amazing what I'm about to do. Just watch. And then verse 29. Why is it that he tells them what he tells them? What is he preparing them for? He says there, and this is the part where you have the opportunity to interact with the sermon this morning, I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will... Oh, that was, I even told you this was coming. Why does he tell them? Belief. Do you believe? He says, some terrible things are going to happen. There's going to be suffering. I'm going to die. I'm telling you all these things so that when it does happen, you're not going to be surprised. You know what's coming. I've told you what's going to happen. Do you believe? What does your belief look like? If you had a meter, do you have 100%? Is it halfway? Where are you? Well, we have doubts. We wonder what it is that we believe and why we believe. I want to take you to an, a quick example. I, I can't leave this part without sharing this with you. It's in Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 27. Uh, I'm not going to put the scripture on the overhead, so if you want to follow along, you're going to have to, to turn there. The scripture is there in your, uh, listed on your bulletin. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 27, talking about belief. Starting in verse 14, it says, when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as the, all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he said. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him in it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashing his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Your unbelie you unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long should I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like that? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes. Here was a man, had a son who was possessed what if you had a kid who was always throwing himself into the fire or into water and trying to kill himself? 
my belief is you would want some help from Jesus. You know what Jesus can do. Jesus has just got done letting them know he's disappointed in their unbelief. The disciples, he asks the question of this man, he talks to this man, and he says, if you can, asking him, do you really believe that I can do what you say I can do? Verse 24, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe but help me over, overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him uh, violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead, but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to the, his feet and he stood up. The father gives an incredibly honest answer. Do you believe? He says, yes, I, I believe that you can do this. But he also exposes something else about who he is. He says, help my unbelief. So many times, that's who I see that I am. Do I believe that Jesus is that who he says he is and that he can do what he says he can do? Without a doubt. But as I sometimes evaluate my faith, I wonder, do I have enough? Is it enough? This man exclaims that to Jesus, that he believes, but there's a part of him that doesn't perhaps understand or can't put this all together. And what does Jesus do? Does he say, well, come back. Come back when you've got it figured out. When you've got all the answers and your belief is at that 100% level. No, he says, I'll heal your son. And he does it. Did he have 100% belief? Is God bigger than the unbelief that you have in your life? I believe that he is and that he continues to show himself to us. That our faith, our belief continues to grow. Continues to grow. That's part of why we use the theme, go deeper is that throughout our life, our faith continues to grow. And it, my faith looks different now as a 46-year-old than it did as a four or five-year-old when I gave my life to him. I hope so, right? 40 years or more of growth. Not always like this. But as we look at the life, our chart of belief, right, we have opportunities to continue to grow and continue to see what is it that God is speaking to us, and how is he teaching us? And why is it now that God, excuse me, that Jesus can, can speak so confidently that, that they will be able to believe and that they will understand and know in the future that those disciples would do the things that he was calling them to do? Look again at verses 25, 26, and 27. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said. Again, Jesus tells them about the Holy Spirit. These are some of the names that we've talked about here in the last couple weeks. The Advocate, the Spirit of Truth, Comforter, Intercessor, Defender, Counselor. We talked about those first three characteristics of of the responsibility or the role that the Holy Spirit has in our life. Again, spirit, we tend to think floating around. Scripture talks of him as a person, just like, he, like Scripture does about God the Father and God the Son. He is the pronoun that is used as a person when we think about the uh, Holy Spirit. That he, the Holy Spirit will help us, that he will be with us forever. Okay, again, referencing the Old Testament when the Holy Spirit would come upon people and then leave. He says, no, when the Holy Spirit, when you submit your life to him, he will be with you forever. And then the third thing that we learn is that he lives in us. We have his presence around us, but as believers, as a disciple, the Holy Spirit will live within you. He gives us two more things, Jesus does, as characteristics of the Holy Spirit in, uh, excuse me, there in verse uh, 26. He says that, 
the Father's going to send him, and he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. He's going to teach us all things. He's going to reveal truth to you. There are going to be things perhaps that you didn't understand yesterday that you will understand today or tomorrow or in the future. He continues to reveal to us the things that we, are, that we need to learn. It's part of that process. He also will remind us of the things that we know or the things that we've heard. You probably have examples in your own life of times when, you, when you're trying to remember a verse or, you, or something pops into your head that hasn't been there for a long time. The Holy Spirit is about, again, bringing back to memory what are the things that I know about who Jesus is, especially during those times uh, of, that we just talked about before that are, that are stressful, those seasons of, of suffering and of serving. Some of those things come flying back about what is, what's the truth that I know about who Jesus is? Another important encouragement for us to memorize Scripture, to know Scripture, again, to give the Holy Spirit a tool to use in our life to continue to point us back to Him. As you do life, you have a teacher, that is the Holy Spirit, who uses those teachable moments to remind you of who you're called to be. You have a person that lives within you as a disciple that uses those teachable moments. So who takes the lead in your life when it comes to growth? Who are we told is supposed to take the lead when it comes to growth? Who's supposed to be teaching you, telling you the things to remember, and also telling you the things that are new? Who's taking the lead in your, the Bible word that I would use is sanctification. Who's supposed to take the lead in sanctification in your life? You or the Holy Spirit? I tend to tell the Holy Spirit me, because I know what's best for me, and I know the things that I learn, need to learn. Jesus says, trust the Holy Spirit to lead you into the things that you're called to learn. Quit trying to make yourself better. That's not your job. That's the Holy Spirit's responsibility. He says he's going to teach us and remind us. We're called to be the student. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. Verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. When you open a last will and testament, you get to hear the things that your parents, your grandparents, or maybe that rich aunt has left for you. And you're wondering, are, am I going to get $100,000? Or perhaps they had a Corvette that they kept in their barn off in some land over there. Here Jesus is talking to his disciples saying, this is what I'm going to leave with you. This is the legacy that I have for you. This is, this is what I'm going to give you. This is the gift that I have for you. Not riches, not power, not a kingdom here on earth. He said it's the Holy Spirit which gives you the gift of peace. You could sleep easy at night. The world will be crazy. People will be burned. Heads chopped off. You will want control. You will want to tell God, but I know what's best for me right now, and this is what you need to do. But he says, I give you something greater than all of that. I give you peace. Tell me today, how much would peace be worth to you? How much is peace worth to you for whatever the situation is that, that you face? What's that peace worth to you? It's priceless. And lastly, well, I skipped, oh, we didn't need that. Uh, and lastly, Christ's example, verses 30 and 31. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me to do. Again, he tells them, I am leaving I don't have much time. What was going on at this exact time while Jesus is talking to his disciples? What's happening on the other side? What is the prince of this world doing? You have Judas Iscariot, who at this time is, is going to the temple to talk to the temple police. You have the Roman soldiers. You have the Sanhedrin 
gathering, getting their lanterns, getting their torches, their swords. Right? It's, it's the SWAT team, right? It's not that much different. I mean, you think about what Jesus has done. They've seen him do miracles. They're prepping. They're saying, okay, Judas, he's going to give him the kiss. It's not going to be a lot of light. We need to know what he looks like. We make sure we get the right guy, right? They're, they're preparing. I also found, I, I, on the internet, you can find pretty much anything. I found this picture of Peter that they had. They're saying, this is Peter, sometimes Simon, Cephas, also known as the rock, right? He's going to be there. Be careful. He's got a sword down here on his, on his leg. He'll be ready for you, right? They're meeting in the Garden of Gethsemane. All of these things are going to take place. They're prepping for that. By the way, the students at Tabor, you might not want to bring this up with your college professor, that that's Peter, because it's not. But they're prepping for it. You got to know that they did. At least I would. You seen if you had seen the miracles that they saw. They came prepared for a fight. There was the leader and eleven guys. They needed to take them. And as we know, Peter was ready, wasn't he? He stepped up. Let's get off of him for a while. Uh, they would be ready for whatever it was, and. Jesus says he's the prince of this world. He's the prince of this world. And what do we learn from Christ's example? And if you don't catch anything else from what uh, I've shared with you this morning, I hope that you don't miss this. This is what Jesus says as all of these things are taking place around him. I love the Father, and I do exactly what he commands. His example to you and I Him knowing everything that's before him is that his obedience was rooted in love. He trusted the Father. He knew that the Father was leading him to Gethsemane. He knew the suffering that was ahead, and he trusted the Father. He continued to trust the Father. He's the example for us. I don't know what's ahead of you in your life. We each have our own path that we're going. I do know that he says we can trust him, and that trust is is called to be rooted in obedience. Excuse me. That obedience, that, that trusting is called to be rooted in his love, that he loves us and that he provides for us. As we end the service, most of the time as we talk about go deeper, I have uh, usually the ways to apply this. However, I'm not going to go through a list of how to apply this in your life because if I really believe what I just spoke with you, it also dawned on me that I should just let the Spirit talk to you and let you talk with Him, which is why I'm going to let you do that. There's a song that's going to be playing. It's about three minutes long, and what I'm giving to you again is time to talk to the Holy Spirit or listen to the Holy Spirit. If you're sitting there and you say, I can't hear the Holy Spirit talking, then feel free to talk with him because he wants to hear from you. It's a, it's a conversation. The song is uh, by uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman, and it just talks about the fact that, uh, man, so many times in my life I'm looking for a flash of lightning or thunder or this big explosion to say, hey, this is what I want you to do. And he talks to us in a, in a still small voice. After that, uh, Tabor will close our service. <laughs>